address I want to use, so I'm going to run it on port 8080. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, logic there where I just map in the URI to indicate how I map my routes to my controllers, standard like ASP.NET, MVC today. Uh, and then I basically just say, hey, I'm going to run this uh, and wait for requests and then process them when they come in. And that's all the code I need. I can hit run. It's now running on 8080. I can now say HTTP localhost 8080 slash API hello. And IE is going to helpfully uh, run a security scan on my JSON because I'm trying to hit it directly. Um, Oh, come on, it's not that much JSON. Um, and hopefully, in a second, uh, it really is secure. Those red shirts aren't that special. Um, hmm. Open. <laughs> or we can use Fiddler. Um, Port 8080 slash API slash hello. Um, and where I run this now, you can see that is both, that's being returned. Uh, uh, and um, uh, from Fiddler, those two objects being served out of the command line console app. So really easy way to host your web APIs in any type of host. Tons of great integration inside ASP.NET MVC, so it's consistent across uh, all types of MVC controllers. But at the same time, if you ever do want to host it inside a custom app or your own NT service, uh, you can go ahead and do that as well. So lots of great things in Web APIs. We're pretty excited about those. Mobile web. So the great thing about Web APIs is you can expose functionality. You can call them from JavaScript. You can call them from native apps uh, that run either in Windows 8 Metro, whether they're in iOS or whether they're Android or any other type of environment. Uh, we also think there's a lot of uh, value in terms of if you don't want to create a custom native app for each platform, how do you go ahead and build a web app that can reach as many platforms as possible uh, with a minimal amount of code? And one of the things we're trying to do with MVC4 is to have a great mobile web story uh, so that you can do that. I showed that off a little bit in the keynote today. I'm going to go ahead and show a few additional things here um, as well. But at a high level, what we're trying to do with MVC4 is allow you as developers to basically build mobile optimized experiences uh, and allow you to start with as little experience or as little amount of work as necessary, um, all the way to building full blown uh, experiences that have rich, real rich interactivity. And you can basically choose along that spectrum how much time and how much effort you need to invest uh, in order to enable each of those different stages of experience. How many people here build a site specifically for mobile devices today? Okay, a number of people do, great. How many people would just like their site to work on mobile devices? Great. Um, and um, hopefully we have an answer for both of you. Um, so basically what you can do is, uh, by default, all of our project templates inside ASP.NET MVC 4 um, support something called adaptive rendering. And so basically that means we use CSS media queries, which kind of take advantage of the new CSS and HTML approaches, which allow you to actually have just one set of markup that at least adaptively uh, redisplays based on your device capabilities. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, um, I could, let's close Fiddler, um, I could go back to our red shirt app here, uh, run it. And one thing you'll notice is, as I kind of resize the screen, notice how the HTML is adapting. So the logo's on the left by default. As I collapse it down and I get too small, it goes on the top. And basically, the content's kind of automatically forming and, and wrapping appropriately. There's nothing really special in ASP.NET that's doing this. Uh, but it's basically, our, our templates are by default now taking advantage of viewports and specifying viewports, um, as well as using CSS media selectors. Uh, and so the benefit here is, if I open this up, um, you can see the viewport, and um, if you go to our CSS files, we're using media selectors, uh, and so by default, you get kind of a nice adaptive rendering um, appropriate to devices, and so if I hit this site with, say, uh, a phone or a tablet, I could do so, and so this is what it would look like on, say, an iOS device. Um, again, it kind of adapts to fit to the appropriate UI um, and works and looks good. So that's kind of approach one that you can take uh, as you're building your sites, is just to kind of take advantage of our default project templates, use media selectors, and that way your site at least looks good on a device even if it's not mobile optimized. 
The next level investment that you can, you can do is to take advantage of something we call display modes. And what display modes allow you to do is effectively override an individual view template, whether it's the layout template or an individual view or even a partial within your project, and have a mobile or device optimized rendering of that view um, in certain places. And you can do this in one place at just the layout, or you can even do it at every individual view template level. And that allows you to have one set of controllers, one set of URLs, um, but if we're necessary, you can kind of optimize it for a smaller screen real estate and really kind of tighten it up far more than you can do with just media selectors. So as an example, let's go back to our red shirt app. And right now, when I hit it with, this, with a mobile device, notice there's a lot of stuff at the top and there's a lot of kind of stuff there that I'm showing. Um, and I might not want to actually show all of that on the page. I might want to just directly get to the content immediately. So what I can do is I can take advantage of this feature. Uh, actually, I'm going to do two things. First, let me get rid of... Um, do I want to get rid of that? Eh. Okay, yeah. Um, let me just hit refresh. Uh, oops, no, sorry. I'm going to copy and paste this. And I'm just going to change my layout template. Uh, so instead of just having a layout template, I'm also going to have a layout.mobile template. Uh, and what I'm basically doing is, again, using kind of a convention over configuration approach um, with an MVC to say, if a regular browser hits this site, render using the layout template. But if a mobile device hits it, I want you to use the mobile template instead. And what I can then do inside the mobile template is, uh, if I open it up, I could replace all of this with mobile-specific code. And just so you don't have to watch me futz around doing that, I'm just going to paste some in. And what I've done here is basically move the navigation to the bottom of the list, uh, the bottom of the page instead of the top of the page. Uh, and um, now when I go ahead and refresh this, what you should see is, well, I actually got rid of the logo too, but uh, you can basically see the content. And then at the very bottom, uh, if I scroll down, Oops, the emulator's not letting me scroll down, but you can sort of see the bottom, my about, and my navigation links there as well. And so that's a simple example where my views didn't change, my controller didn't change, but simply by change my, changing my layout page, I can now reduce cruft, I can focus on small devices, and I can customize it however I want. Uh, what's nice is you can not only just have a mobile view, you can even go to specifics where you have an iOS view or Win8 view, an Android view, or whatever type of definition you want. Uh, the actual prefixes we use here are custom, uh, are, are customizable, so you can define any layers of extensibility you want, and you can have as custom an experience or not. And if I wanted to, for example, further customize the home view, I could just go in and say, oh, I'm going to have an index.mobile template as well, where I want to customize the content even further within it. And so you can choose it, whatever granularity you want within your view templates that you want to override it, and you can have as custom an experience as you want, depending on different devices. And then if you want to go even further uh, and have kind of a mobile optimized specific version of your site, we also have the ability, so if I wanted to create, the, say, the red shirt mobile version, I could select this mobile application project template, which is similar to what I did in the keynote this morning. Uh, this project template uses, among other things, jQuery mobile. Uh, and so uh, it actually kind of fully embraces mobile and touch. And you'll see here, uh, it basically um, uh, makes it really easy to have kind of a navigation experience. On a mobile device, it has, uh, let's hit it, that mobile device. It also has animations built in, so you notice we slide back and forth. Ooh, very exciting. Ooh. Um, it also, jQuery Mobile has a nice mechanism where if you want to, you can easily change from predefined styles. So for example, I can just say, use theme C instead of theme B. Uh, and if I go ahead now and hit reload, um, it now has a slightly different style, so it has some built-in styles you can take advantage of, some built-in navigation patterns, uh, and this allows you to run much more client-side logic um, on the client, and then I can go ahead and, uh, if I want to, either do standard posts back to ASP.NET and render HTML. I could also start using that web API layer that we introduced in the previous section if I want to write more client-side JavaScript using jQuery mobile to retrieve and post data and actually work at an API level against my site instead. 
So basically you get a whole bunch of different options in terms of a spectrum that you can use with MVC4 for building mobile apps. It can start as simple as just uh, use CSS media queries to, to render, to adapt your HTML. You can use display modes to override view templates. You can build a fully immersive mobile experience. And if you want to, you could just say, hey, we're not going to have any UI. We're instead going to expose web APIs and I'm going to build a native mobile experience that calls those APIs programmatically and have a completely uh, integrated experience into whatever device you want. Moving along, real-time communication. Uh, how many people here are doing real-time communication within their web apps today? Yeah, no one. How many people here think that sounds cool, though? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, it's cool. So, uh, you know, a lot of times I get asked from people like, hey, how do I push something from the server to the client so that the client gets an immediate update and they don't have to pull back and forth on the server? And usually that is a long discussion around that, why that's a bad idea and it's hard to do and, and the people leave upset. Um, and that's in the past. Uh, what we're trying to do in the future is make that actually achievable and, and relatively easy to do. Um, and um, there's one of the things that we're, we're working on as a team is a project we call SignalR, uh, which kind of provides a really nice programming model for doing it. It basically allows you to build multi-user real-time web apps. You can push notifications not only to a single user, but to multiple users. Uh, you can do server-to-client push as well as kind of RPC-style back and forth. And you can literally scale to thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of connections um, across a server farm. And one of the things we're actually doing also is even supporting the ability to integrate within Windows Azure and the service bus so that you could have any number of web servers talking to any number of clients. Uh, and so if you wanted to have like a million people all chatting in real time, which would be kind of chaos, but it would be kind of cool, uh, it's a cool technical problem, you could actually do it. SignalR automatically negotiates the transport. So if it's a browser that supports WebSockets, which ASP.NET 4.5 does on Windows 8, uh, we'll automatically use WebSockets. Uh, at the same time, it can fall back and use either server send events, forever frames, or AJAX long pollings. So even on IE7, this will actually work. Um, and um, it's open source, um, and you can download the source from GitHub. Uh, and um, it's pretty cool. So let's actually walk through it here. Basically, the idea is uh, you have a server and a client piece in order to enable it. On the server piece, you just create a uh, class that derives from a hub. And within that uh, class, and then you just name it whatever you want. Uh, your JavaScript on the client, you import a uh, SignalR library, and then basically you can set up what's called a hub on the client, which you can talk to this one on the server with. And so basically the code here just says connection.chat. What you can then do is from within any standard JavaScript on your client, so this is just standard jQuery, uh, I can go ahead and send a message to the server. And I just expose whatever methods I want on the server, and I can marshal arguments back and forth between them. And then the cool part about SignalR is that on the server side, I can actually say clients dot, and I can actually call client side JavaScript methods from the server. So this is using the new dynamic feature that we added in .NET 4 and with the languages there. And this is basically going to translate into a server push to the client to call any endpoint that I've defined in my JavaScript and pass in whatever argument I want. Uh, and it's kind of magic. Um, but here's some cool stuff that what you can do. So it's pretty simple. Let's op uh, in terms of concept, let's open up a simple project to kind of show what you can do with it. So we'll go here, there, 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 there. So what I have here is a class called MoveShape. Uh, it's on the server, and it's a hub class, and it has a single method called MoveShape. It takes an, in, an X and Y, and it calls clients.shapeMoved and passes the value back. And so the idea is I can have any number of users connect to my hub, and when, when any of them sends a move shape command, it'll be rebroadcasted to everyone else that's listening. And this client's API is a dynamic object, so shape moved doesn't actually exist on the server. Instead, I'm indicating the client side JavaScript function I want to call. Here's what the HTML looks like. So it's, it's actually just an HTML page, it's not even an ASP.NET view, but obviously it could be. And I'm using jQuery, jQuery UI, uh, and I'm using the SignalR library. And then here is all my client-side JavaScript. And so basically all I'm doing is I'm connecting to the hub on the server. I'm using jQuery to retrieve uh, the shape object, which in this case here is just a div uh, in my HTML, which is styled to be kind of a square. And then basically every time someone drags and drops it in the page, 
uh, so I'm using a jQuery UI function. I call the server method and pass in the X and Y. And then I basically...